Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. There has been a lot of attention focused on America's criminal justice system lately, but what about our civil justice system? Americans and American companies spend billions of dollars suing each other every year. Does this system protect average Americans, or is it just a legal lottery in which the lawyers win big? Joining us to sort through the conflict and consensus are Philip Howard, author of the best-selling The Death of Common Sense, How Law is Suffocating America. Paul Rothstein, professor of law at Georgetown University. Michael Horowitz, senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and co-author of Rethinking Contingency Fees. And Jonathan Turley, professor of law at George Washington University. The topic before this house, Are Lawyers Ruining America? This week on Think Tank. Americans have been suing each other since the founding of the Republic, but today many fear that lawsuits are getting out of hand. Some recent examples explain why. In 1994, McDonald's was told to pay a woman $2.7 million after she was burned by spilling McDonald's coffee on herself. Her lawyers persuaded the jury that the coffee was too damned hot. The Supreme Court is considering a recent case against BMW of America. A jury decided that the car maker should pay $4,000 in compensatory damages to the buyer of a $40,000 car. The charge, BMW did not disclose that they had painted over a $600 blemish before selling it. Fair enough. But the jury also hit BMW with $4 million in punitive damages. Defenders of the system say consumers are protected by such lawsuits. Without punitive damages, there would be no incentive for corporations to improve safety or truth in labeling. But critics say we can no longer afford a system which encourages drop-of-a-hat lawsuits. For example, an estimate cited by author Philip Howard says America spends up to $200 billion per year on medical procedures performed largely to avoid malpractice suits. Defenders say this results in better medical care. As part of the contract with America, the House and Senate are considering limiting the damages injured parties can receive, as well as forcing losers to pay the legal costs for both sides. But some fear this would unfairly prevent poor people from bringing legitimate cases against big corporations. So the question that taunts us is, is there a better way? First question, uh, let's go around the room quickly, starting with you, uh, Philip Howard. There is obviously something wrong. Do we need an overhaul or a tune-up? Well, I think it's closer to an overhaul, but not for most of the reasons people, people state. I th the numbers are hard to get a handle on. The, even that medicine number, most people, many people say it's 100 million, <laughs> not 200. Some people argue 50. Billion. But, billion, I'm sorry, billion. But it's a big number. But the problem I feel requires changing is that a fear has come across the land. It's a fear because people don't trust courts anymore to ensure the reasonable result. So what one expert calls a catastrophobia <laughs> has descended. Teachers are scared to kick kids out of classrooms. Doctors do defensive medicine. People go to work trying to avoid legal risk instead of trying to get somewhere. And that's the reason I believe we need reform. Okay, Michael Horowitz, uh, to, to an upper overhaul. Overhaul, and I agree with Philip. Uh, what's at risk here is Americans' respect for the rule of law. This is a country where lawyers have played a great role, as Tocqueville pointed out, but the excesses are extraordinary. And I'm less worried about the McDonald's coffee cup case than I am about the doctor who drunkenly saws off the wrong leg, who in today's system automatically makes a lawyer a multimillionaire. Lawyers are using our monopoly of access to the courts to take 40% out of every single injury, whether or not they assume risks, whether or not it's a tough case. That's crazy. It's costly. Okay, overhaul. Paul Rothstein. 
I'm very reluctant uh, to do very much at all to the system because what usually happens is protections for the individual are removed in the name of reforms or tune-ups and no uh, complementary protections of another kind are put in. Uh, this is the safest country in the world largely because of the tort system. Uh, it's a beautiful system in the sense that it links up the lawyer's self-interest with helping poor unfortunate people. Uh, no one's going to help anybody really very much just out of charity. Charities don't work that well. Now you could say that doctors for example and companies are trying to avoid legal risk and that's a bad idea but in trying to avoid legal risk what they're really doing another way to say that is that they're trying to avoid safety risks and that is a good thing. Jonathan Turley. Well I, I don't even agree that we necessarily need a tune-up in this system. I think that there's a parade of horribles that have been brought to us but I'm not sure in reality this bears out. There's a good reason why a doctor who cracks open my chest is fearful of a suit. I want him to be fearful. I want him to be concerned about me and about what he might do to me through negligence. There's a certain reason why we have a legal system that tells people that they have to take, a, take special care. And it also tells industry that they can't externalize the cost of their activities to others, cannot force us to bear the cost of their activity. The tort system is vital in that sense. It's a vital check. And when Congress is removing regulatory controls off corporations and reducing enforcement of environmental laws and safety laws, the last thing we have is our ability to protect ourselves. And suddenly we find that even that is being reduced. All right. Uh, let me ask just one definitional question, which is about the word uh, tort. We know it is not a uh, piece of bakery, but will somebody uh, describe for me Thank what a correct. tort is? Just a straight <laughs> definition. Okay. Tort is a civil lawsuit by one party against another where uh, the defendant has done something wrong and has injured the plaintiff, the claimant, and has to pay for it. To well, it's not quite as simple as that. What we have are two bodies of common law. One is contracts. Well, what the courts do is try to figure out what you and I agreed to and enforce our agreement. Tort law is the body of law where the courts figure out what your duty is to me and what you ought to pay to me. One tries to do and enforce what people want where, the, where there's a much more passive role that the judges play. The other is a system in which the judges define one's duty to the next and what one's payment ought to be to the other. And there's a tension between the two. And over the last 20 years, if you and I agree to share risk in a contract, tort law has just overwhelmed that because the courts say, there, there, Ben, you didn't really mean to get in that agreement. Horowitz will have to pay you whatever you agree Well, that's, that's not true. I mean, tort law uh, recognizes things like assumption of risk. It also recognizes consensual agreements. Sure. Uh, there are limitations to what you can agree to, limitations to what you can contract to. Jonathan, there isn't a question but that. In modern day tort law, we're talking about developments over the last 20, 25 years, we have had what uh, the, the academics have called tort law converted into a social insurance mechanism. That is, payment by and large and increasingly without fault by the actor who injures a party. Whatever the parties may have agreed to between themselves. That's what's a wrong with that? What's wrong with that? Ah, Until well. we get a better system. Now, in any system as large as ours, we're going to have occasional ab aberrations ah. like the woman that spilled coffee. But I'll tell you what's wrong with it, Ben. The history Maitland and other historians have said that the essence of our march to democracy in the West is the rule of contract. That is, we've moved from a feudal society to a contract society because courts enforce agreements and the smart, poor guy who can gauge risk and gain better than the dumb, rich guy quickly becomes a rich guy. Oh, no, but we they, don't they... have a feudal system because we've respected notions of contract. We've let parties make their own deals and enforce them. Tort law is the system by which the courts come in and say, whatever you guys have agreed to, we have a better notion about who should bear risks and well, costs. Well, that's it's not dangerous true. Now, wait, in why, that why, sense. I mean, if, 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 uh, uh, if the surgeon cutting into Jonathan's chest uh, makes a major error, mm -hmm. I mean, there was no contract there. I mean, right. he, he is negligent. Why, why shouldn't he be uh, he ought to. suable? He ought to, and we ought to return to classic notions of tort law as we knew it 25 years ago before it became this mass income redistribution machine with lawyers right. taking the contract. Right. Well, that, we, we, we have uh, Philip Howard here. Uh, you <coughs> have been the noticeably problem. silent, sir. Right. 
Well, the problem, I get stuck in these ideological battles. The problem is one of how it works. Uh, I don't believe we should do away with the tort system. I think people should be able to sue each other, obviously, when someone else makes a mistake, that the surgeon surgeon makes a mistake. The question is whether the result is in a reasonable result. And what's happened in this country, and it's happened enough so that people are scared, is that the result isn't reasonable, not because someone shouldn't be liable, but because you tag on a $10 million or $20 million punitive damages verdict where it's not warranted in the circumstances, warranted as defined by community mores. And judges exercising no control over the reasonableness of results are acting like referees. But, but don't let the lawyers argue anything. Don't the juries jury. represent community mores? I mean, uh, they're who, the ultimate who, democratic who, institution. Who, who better? No, judges, in fact, have an important role in the management of the courtroom. I happen to be, have an advantage in that I'm a practicing lawyer. I believe strongly that judges have and traditionally, traditionally they have and should define the limits of community mores. If I trip on the sidewalk and go in and try to sue for $100 million for writer's block, the judge shouldn't allow that to go to the Wait, jury. Wait, but you don't, you don't want the judge to define mores. You want the judge to define standards. I, I mean, want him God to help us if the judge defines mores. I want him to define the limits of community mores. I don't think that someone without any objective evidence or clear evidence of malice should have a punitive damage claim Going, going to the jury. But Phil, because the, the judges, effect of the that judges do exercise that role. In your favorite McDonald's case, the judge exercised that role and cut down uh, two the million, damages. Two million. And right, by the yeah, way, right, but still, I think but still gave the woman two million dollars. But, but the I fact mean, is, for, for spilling. But this is an on herself. Well, but this is an example of the parade of horribles. It's I think that was a terrific. Well, but but wait, I think, wait, but wait, I think wait, that wait, was a terrific wait, case. The question is, is the system? The question, to me at least, is, is the system working reasonably? Do the people have confidence in it? And I believe, in the case of the McDonald's case, I happen to, to have debated the judge in, in the McDonald's case, um, what he did wrong is letting it go to the jury. There's a huge interorum effect of letting a huge claim go to the jury. People settle. Well, let's talk about Settle cases oh, 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 just because of the downside risk. He should have cut it off I, at the I, outset. I just want to pick up <clears throat> one thing from Jonathan Turley. Tell us, uh, I, I find it mind-boggling, but tell us why you think that the McDonald's case where a woman got two million dollars for spilling coffee on herself was a justifiable While driving verdict. Because, Car, in this, because in this parade of horribles, certain mm -hmm. facts are left out. One of the facts left out is the fact that McDonald's had over 700 such claims brought against it. Another fact is that the McDonald's parade of horribles, and right. that McDonald's also. I uh, was keeping its, its, the temperature of its coffee a good 50 degrees over its competitors. Mm -hmm. Also left out was the fact that she did offer to settle, something that I would think uh, would be delightful to, to two of our panelists. She was willing to settle for $20,000, and McDonald's told her to take a walk, and so she sued. And then the jury found out this evidence, and they were very, very upset. But the interesting thing about the model presented uh, here is that this court system apparently has lawyers acting irrationally by not accepting early settlement offers and instead of instead going for big uh, damage awards uh, where the costs come out of their own pocket judges acting irrationally by allowing them to go to the juries juries acting irrationally apparently the only people not acting irrationally in the system are corporations that make bad defective products and decisions let's get a few things straight the first is that the American people think that the system is irrational and this is Phil's point we're not talking about historic lawyer bashing which is a great American sport over 50% of the American people think lawyers are less honest than most people. And what's striking about it is that those numbers have doubled within the last five to 10 years. Over two thirds of the American people think that lawyers are in the system for their own advantage to the benefit of their clients. That's the American people speaking. That's because people only contact lawyers when they're in trouble, so they associate lawyers with trouble. But I tell you it's a good system until we design something better to link up the greed of one group of people to helping others who have been injured. That's a perfect wedding of interest. That seems to me to, uh, to not be a bad thing at all. Well, why do we have, I, I think I saw the figure, what, either a hundred times more lawyers than the Japanese or a thousand times more lawyers because than the Japanese? Because we have more frictions uh, where, where a lot of different peoples, uh, different kinds of people living under the same umbrella, mm -hmm. and there's going to be frictions. You Those do not believe that there has been, I guess, what is called in the trade over litigiousness, that we've gone on a legal binge generally in this country? The number of lawyers has soared, the number of cases has soared, the amount of settlements have soared. 
No, I, I really don't think so. I think there might be a better way to structure it, but nobody's talking about it. They're just talking about removing what we have. We're, 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 we're going to talk about that in a minute. It's not fair and it's not true. I, I think one needs to get it from two perspectives. The first is, over the last 20 years, the risk to defendants through things like punitive damages are so great in terms of what they may lose in a case you got to bet your company, you got a gun to your head in order to play the game so that the justice system for many defendants is a kabuki to reduce the size of the ransom. No rational defendant facing the end of his company in one jury trial will do anything other than settle. So that's a problem at one end. Defendants are now confronted with excessive risks and they must settle and they do. The second side and of the coin... Some have gone out of business like Dow Corning. Precisely. And, and the good example you gave, the guy didn't settle for 20,000 bucks, he's hit now with four million. Well, plenty of people take that message and they settle because they can't bear that crazy kind of risk that the system imposes. But there's a second part, Ben, if I can get it in. And that is on the cases where there is no substantial dispute, where we all agree there should be a suit, where we all agree that there should be a payment, Lawyers are still getting 40% of the take. Phil Howard, uh, the case that Jonathan Turley makes that, that doctors will perform better because of this pressure on them and make you more safe and his chest more safe, is that a valid argument? Uh, life is complicated. If people are scared... Well, you have four lawyers if, around here. If, Everybody's if people it's are scared right. too much, no, it's counterproductive. They perform unnecessary procedures, as many doctors do, unnecessary tests at a time. The other day, an employee of a friend of mine had a headache for a few days, went to the doctor, ordered an MRI test, cost $1,200, sure enough, turned out to be sinusitis. That, that reaction times tens of thousands of times is wasting social resources. We need people to make reasonable judgments, which means that they should be scared if they, if they mess up but they shouldn't be so terrified of ruination that they retire from the practice, which a lot of doctors are doing. And I'd like to respond to Jonathan's point about people acting irrationally. I don't think juries act ir ir irrationally at all because courts, and I am a courtroom lawyer, have become a kind of theater where the people go in, they, they act out these horrible, look at the burns this lady suffered in the McDonald's case, third degree burns. And if you were there, all these people are taking the, the argument seriously. If you're on the jury and it's, the case is going on for a while, you're going to take it seriously, but too. But, Philip, there's another lawyer there. He can make these arguments. This jury yeah. wasn't selected from the family of the plaintiff's counsel. More argument is not more justice. If judges don't sit there and allocate, in the case of McDonald's, which is where, where I do know the facts, in yeah. fact, the, there were 700 complaints out of over 7 billion cups of coffee sold in the same period. It wasn't 50 degrees hotter, it was 10 or 15 degrees hotter, and it was 32 degrees less hot than the boiling water you and I make every morning. It is a silly case, but the court, my point is, the court in a case like that should have said it's, it's, it's an ordinary risk of life, but case dismissed. Philip, what we have here is that you say it's a silly case. I don't believe it is a silly case. I think that McDonald's was outrageous in its decision. Do you accept his facts? I, which I don't accept that they, they, no, I don't. But 180 but they, degrees. I know but the, they, no, but the I've difference is that uh, the court, the, there, was there was significant evidence that was given at, 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 at the court that McDonald's could serve coffee at a lower temperature. But, now, the question, though, is if, if, if McDonald's wants to serve l coffee at a, at a higher temperature, they have to realize that the tort system will force them to internalize those yeah. costs. If they conclude that billions of cups of coffee are more valuable than protecting those lives, fine, but they can't avoid you know, the damages. That, 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 you know, one point that hasn't been raised here, which is a very important point in, in the tort mm -hmm. system, is that the reason this problem exists is because of the rise of unquantifiable damages like pain and suffering, pun and suffer, uh, uh, punitive damages, uh, uh, emotional distress, things that have no objective yardstick. If someone breaks their leg in an accident and they, and, and they, and they miss work and such, you can count up the damages and that, what, that is what used to be known as compensatory damages. In the last, since World War II, there's been this rise of this other kind of damage that courts allow um, and, and they are legitimate in okay. some cases, but they have no yardstick. All right. Uh, let's close this out uh, briefly now with uh, this question. What should we do about it? Mike Horowitz. Well, 
Philip raises just the right point. Uh, it's these uncalculable damages. Pain and suffering is the real engine. It's the cash that gets added to your real damages that for the most part goes to pay the plaintiff's lawyer's fee. The way it works is for every dollar of medical injuries you have, there's a three dollar multiplier that largely goes to pay the lawyer. It's called pain and suffering damages. We have a system, therefore, that for every dollar of medicals that I run up, the rest of you pay the bill through the insurance system, and for every dollar of my bills you pay, me and my lawyer, mostly my lawyer, get three dollars. What should we do? We've got to deal with this so-called pain and suffering system. We've got to give people the choice, the contractual choice, to opt out of the racket world of pain and suffering. One statistic. Well, how, how could they do that if, if, if that's the, the law? Ah, well, we, we've got to change the law to be sure. We've got to allow people to say, as I drive, I know the hazards of driving. I may have <clears throat> medical damages, I may have death, I may have lost wages if I get in an accident, and I may have pain and suffering. But I want to pay an insurance premium that is, on the whole, 40% lower than what I'm paying now in order to give up the right to sue for, quote, pain and suffering. Okay, all right, that's one idea. Uh, Philip Howard, do you have an idea? Uh, I do have an idea. Is, I mean, is my ultimate your... idea is to change the culture of judges, which is not an overnight idea. I would change the presumption. I would say that, that you cannot have unquantifiable, so-called non-economic damages below, but maybe you'd have a cap. Unless, that, that and then I would add a that phrase. That cap is embodied in the, uh, in the contract, contract with yes, America yeah. that is now being considered. They have a cap of $250,000 for non-economic damages. And you approve of that generally? Well, generally, except that it's too rigid. So I would add a comma and a phrase that says, unless the judge, in the interest of justice, decides that the cap should be waived. So I would change the presumption. I would give judges the power, because there are outrageous cases where people should, should suffer or get punitive damages. But I would change the presumption and make judges actually affirmatively permit the claims to be made. Because to now, now the presumption is much too much in the other direction where they let any claim, no matter how ridiculous, okay. go to the jury. Okay. Uh, Jonathan Turley, do you, are, are you going to uh, be Dr. Fix-It for us? <laughs> well, the problem is I think the diagnosis is wrong. And that is, uh, first of all, pain and suffering are not simply a multiplier used in every case. In many cases, pain and suffering damages are not. Uh, found by the jury. Moreover, it's not money that goes directly to the uh, to the attorney. There are real pain and suffering findings by the jury. Just dismissing them all as a gift to attorneys is just speculation. There, there are real cases of pain and suffering. In terms of punitive damages, do you know how many punitive damage suits have been brought in the in twenty on a twenty five year period? Three hundred and thirty five punitive damages uh, uh, cases have been brought. This now, is in the whole country? No, no, no. Not brought. Maybe not brought. Award. You mean award. That have been awarded. 335 okay. awards of punitive damages. In the, in for system, one year? Uh, that's for, no, it's for a 25-year no. period. Yes, it is. It's, it's, it's a figure okay. that has appeared but in, it's in all of the it's an irrelevant, reports ones you rely on. It's an irrelevant on. figure anyway, because the issue, most cases are resolved through settlement. And if you've got that gun to your head where you're confronting Michael, $20 million as a judgment in a $2,000 case, you're going to settle. Michael, the figures that you put forward in terms of taking out transactional costs, which frankly I don't see any support for, um, are very, very speculative. Okay. Paul Rothstein. Pain and suffering. Uh, uh, is is a real thing. Who's to say how much it's worth to be rendered a uh, to be the breadwinner of a family and be rendered a quadriplegic with all the infinite amount of trouble and pain that causes your life for all those moments of your life that you have less millions and millions of moments. Who's to say how much that is worth? Some judge or the voice of the community? I would say that if the populace will not vote for some kind of sensible insurance that pays people who are injured and who need it, uh, then we should leave the present so tort system intact. But I do recognize that Philip is making some sense that there could be a kind of presumptive limit on damages as long as there's a, an escape hatch that allows the judge to open it wide. Okay. Thank you, uh, four distinguished uh, attorneys and not surprisingly several different opinions. Thank you, Philip Howard, Jonathan Turley. Michael Horowitz and Paul Rothstein, and thank you. We enjoy hearing from you. Please send your comments and questions to New River Media, 
1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036, or we can be reached via email at thinktv at aol.com or on the World Wide Web at www.thinktank.com. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.